Okay, so it looks like folks are starting to pile in. Um, hopefully everybody is finding the audio buttons. Um, we'll just give it two minutes for folks to enter the webinar. And then we'll get started. For folks that are just entering the webinar right now, we're just giving it a couple of minutes for people to, to enter the webinar. So if you're hearing silence, that is uh, by design. Okay, so it is um, 1231 by my clock. So I think we're gonna get started here and a few more folks will join us probably as the uh, webinar gets started. Um, so welcome everyone today to today's webinar. Good afternoon. Um, as some of you are aware, my name is Lara Kroll and I'm the Senior Health Human Resource Analyst for the BC, BC Care Providers Association. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is focused on the WorkSafe BC presumptive clause as it relates to COVID-19 in the seniors living and continuing care sector. Um, so if that's what you're here to learn about today, then you are in the right place. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we're gathered on the ancestral and unceded territory of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples across British Columbia. We would like to thank them for being good caretakers of the land and allowing us to be visitors on this shared territory to do good work. Um, in particular, I'd like to note that the offices of the BC Care Providers Association and Safe Care BC are hosted on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to hold this dialogue here today. Um, so on that note, we are co-hosting this event between the BC Care Providers Association and Safe Care BC, and the presentation will be led by Lauren from WorkSafe BC. Um, in terms of housekeeping items, we're using the Zoom webinar function here today. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, we, all, we will hold um, some time for questions at the end, and we do ask that you enter it into the Q&A function. Um, my colleagues, uh, Melissa and Anna, will also be monitoring the chat function um, in case you have any um, technical challenges or, or questions throughout the event, and uh, we will direct questions to Lauren at the end of the presentation. I will note that the session today is being recorded and it will be available to delegates after the presentation. We will also make the slide deck available and it will be circulated afterwards. On that note, I'm pleased to introduce Lauren Tom from WorkSafe BC. Lauren is a client services manager in special care services at WorkSafe BC. Her work involves leading a team that adjudicates and manages occupational disease claims, as well as supporting the workplace fatality team. She graduated from Simon Fraser University in 2006 and has been with WorkSafe BC for 15 years. And without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, so thanks everybody for um, being here and being interested in this topic. Um, as Laura mentioned, my name is Lauren Tom. I'm a client services manager in occupational disease services. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you today um, about the workers' compensation, compensation system and specifically how it relates to COVID-19. I understand that as, as an organization, uh, of employers, you have questions about contagious disease presumption clause, what it means for senior care facilities, what factors are taken into account when we're in investigating a claim, and also specifically what role asymptomatic uh, transmission can play. So I've put this presentation together specifically for you to address those questions and hopefully some others that maybe you have thought of. But if anyone has questions as we're going along, like they had said, if you could just put that into the Q&A, we can save them um, for the end and then we can kind of go through those and, and then address any specific questions that you have. And so with that, I'd like to start. So before we get into the specific presumption clause as it relates to COVID-19, I think it's really important to understand just what the word presumption means in the context of compensation. So first, what is presumption? Well, put simply, presumption eliminates the need for workers to prove their condition. So in this case, a contagious disease, 
was caused by their work. It will be presumed. So as you may be familiar with, or maybe not, um, WorkSafe BC has other presumptive clauses that have been standing for years for certain occupations and certain diseases. Um, the most kind of public one that you may have heard about is for firefighters and different types of cancers. We also have some a presumption clause in place for certain occupations and mental health conditions. So this follows along that same vein, if you're familiar with those policies. Um, and cont the contagious disease presumption is the most recent clause that was added. And so we'll just get going to talk about that specific clause. So first, it's important to know that in any presumption, there's what we call two columns of different criteria. Um, so as of, uh, so I'm going to talk about both columns. This slide will be column one, the second slide will be column two, and that kind of just puts it all together. So what do you need to know about presumption? Um, it used to be called Schedule B, now it's called Schedule 1. That's just, oops, went forward. There we go. That's just a naming convention. So as of August 20th, 2020, Schedule 1 was revised to include consideration for contagious diseases. Um, previously, contagious diseases were not considered in Schedule 1. So to date, the occupational disease included in Schedule 1 are associated with specific occupations, industries, and processes, uh, and were added to Schedule 1 only when our board of directors was satisfied from expert medical and scientific evidence that there was substantially greater incidence of that particular disease to a particular employment process or occupation. The requirements of Schedule 1 related to contagious diseases aren't that specific. They are not associated in this case with specific occupations or processes. And I'll get uh, into the specific language of that uh, in a second. But rather, Schedule 1 requires the officer or case manager to establish a couple of things. First, they need to establish if what is being claimed is caused by a communicable viral pathogen. So in this case, COVID-19 is caused by a communicable viral pathogen. The second thing in column one that they need to consider then is if one of these criteria are met. So A is a notice given under 52.2 of the Public Health Act, um, and or B is a state of emergency declared under Section 9.1 of the Emergency Program Act, a state of local emergency declared under 12.1, or an emergency declared under Section 173. You might not be familiar with what these particular things are, but in, in kind of normal terms, a notice given under 52.2 of the Public Health Act, we currently have orders under the Public Health Act in regards to certain activities that we can do in the province. So currently there are notices under uh, Section 52.2. B is not met right now because we are no longer in a state of emergency. Um, the state of emergency, as you might recall, was lifted on June 30th at 11.59 p.m., of this year, as of July 1st, we are no longer under a state of emergency. However, um, number two of this is met because there still are orders under the Public Health Act. So once an officer is satisfied that what the person is claiming is caused by a communicable viral pathogen, and one of these is met, they move on to column two. And what we're looking at in column two usually is an occupation. So if we're talking about cancer, we're looking for a firefighter or a mechanic or something like that. For contagious diseases, there is no list of occupations. So what needs to be satisfied is that there is a risk of exposure to a source or sources of the infection, so in this case COVID-19, that is significantly greater than the public at large. The risk of exposure has to occur during the applicable notice or under column one, so during the period of time that there was um, a state of emergency or during the period of time that there were orders. And the risk of, it oh, keeps flipping on me, sorry. And the risk of exposure has to occur within the geographical area of the applicable notice. Right now, the Public Health Act orders include all of BC. Uh, when there was the state of emergency, it included all of BC. Uh, but there could be instances in the future and this policy didn't just want to speak to what's happening now, but perhaps something that could happen in the future. So it could be the case that there is a state of emergency in one region, but there is not a state of emergency in another region. So you might think of um, in the past many years ago, you might be familiar with SARS. Uh, Ontario declared a state of emergency. BC did not declare, declare a state of emergency. So in that instance, um, 
for the purposes of, of compensation in British Columbia, presumption would not have applied because there was no state of emergency in British Columbia. So some key takeaways here um, is that as of August 20th, 2020, the contagious diseases are now included in Schedule 1 of the Act for a disease caused by a communicable viral pathogen. And what I really want to stress here is that the reason why it was included is so that the onus was not put on a worker to have to prove the person or instance that they got COVID-19 in. As we know, contact tracing can be and has been very robust. Um, but it is quite onerous for somebody you have to point to a coworker or to a patient and say, I got it from this person. So it was looked at a holistic perspective and just saying, does that person's job duties put them at higher risk than the general public? Um, and, and another uh, important point is, if that is the case, did their job duties put them at higher risk? The other piece is, is there anything to rebut that presumption? So by rebutting the presumption, we mean um, anything that would say, no, that is, despite that being the case, we know they got it elsewhere. So when we're adjudic adjudicating claims, we always ask the worker, regardless of what their job duties are, regardless of whether we think they're put at higher risk, what do you do outside of work? Was anybody else in the house sick before you, after you? Uh, were you contacted by public health as being um, a close contact of somebody with COVID-19 outside of the workplace? So we do gather all of that information in order to be able to determine, one, if that, if that person was at higher risk, and two, if there's anything to rebut that presumption. Um, the second piece is that there has to be a BC state of emergency or uh, any of those other three items that were on column one, but the most common one or the one that we were dealing with at the time was the BC state of emergency. Now we have the orders under the Public Health Act. If none of those are satisfied, we do not look at the contraction of COVID in the workplace under presumption. We have a regular policy for that. That's called policy item 28.00. Um, it its language is very similar to presumption, but it requires us to take a deeper look at what the exact situation was on perhaps that short time period that the person would have uh, would have contracted COVID, and looking at things like was there an outbreak, um, where you know where did they get it from, can we can we pinpoint where they got it from? So it requires just a bit more investigation under Policy Twenty Eight. Right now. Uh, we are looking at these claims under presumption. We have to look at every COVID-19 claim under presumption because we do have those orders under the Public Health Act. When those orders are taken away, none of those four criteria will be met because hopefully we won't be under a state of emergency. They will have taken the public health orders away. So then presumption will still be a law, but it will not be one that we can turn our mind to when, when talking about COVID-19 or when adjudicating COVID-19. It will still be available, though, in the future if COVID-2035 happens or some other type of contagious disease that is a pandemic situation that meets those criteria, then we will we'll revert to adjudicating those claims um, under this contagious disease policy. Uh, we were hoping and we were thinking that when the public health emergency went away, um, the orders would go away as well on June 30th at 11.59 p.m. because um, then we would have all gone into uh, stage four, which is essentially back to normal. Um, and so that's what we were preparing for as an organization. But obviously, you all would know just from probably from your workplaces, but also the numbers in the province as a whole. Uh, in the weeks leading up to September 7th, it looked um, much more like that wasn't going to be the case, and it wasn't. So right now we're still operating in a world of presumption. So that's the presentation itself. I mean, it's quite a narrow topic. Um, so other than kind of laying that out, um, I think I would just turn it over probably for questions now, because I find that, that these presentations, that's where kind of the fruitful discussions can happen about particular nuances. Um, so I'll just open it up to see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, so again, I do invite you to um, put your questions in the Q&A function um, while we're waiting for folks to pose those questions there. I do have a couple of uh, questions uh, that came from uh, myself and the other staff. So maybe we'll start with those ones. Sure. Um, 
So Anna was wondering what would happen to someone who had COVID, for example, but let's say they never filed a claim. Can they do it after the fact? Um, you know, let's say they got COVID last year, for example, and maybe they just thought, well, it'll be a two week illness, but you know, it turns out, you know, it's been six months because they're having these long haul COVID symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say to that piece? Yeah, so um, COVID-19 claims are treated just like any other claim in terms of your time limit for claiming. So section 151 of the Act says a claim has to be filed within one year, 12 months of an injury. So in that example, Laura, if somebody was um, sick six months ago, um, they could come to us now and file a claim and we would adjudicate it. Uh, just to be transparent, one of our questions would be, why didn't you file six months ago? Um, but we have um, come across lots of situations like that because um, over this period of time, I think a lot of folks, employers included, but lots of workers have been confused about what benefits they should be claiming. Because when COVID happened, all, we had CERB. And then following that, we basically had like four different kinds of CERB, like four different kinds of COVID um, relief that people could be applying for. Um, and, and I don't think that many people, especially at the beginning, uh, thought that a contagious disease could be considered work, a work-related injury. So there's been lots of education that's gone on about that. We're quite confident that now going forward, um, folks do understand, employers understand, workers understand, because we've been doing a lot of outreach in that area. But if people historically were ill and didn't know, they can certainly come to us. If it's over 12 months, it's not stopping them from coming to us. We would just, they would just need to submit to us um, particular reasons as to why they waited the 12 months. And we'd have to see if we would accept those. Um, so it's a long way of saying the same, the same uh, principle applies under 151. It has to be within 12 months. Okay, that's really helpful to understand. Um, and I sort of know the answer to this because we had a bit of a discussion before doing this webinar, but um, I imagine there's a couple of folks um, thinking the same thing of, you know, we have this presumptive clause. Usually it would apply to a list of occupations, but it works mm -hmm. a little bit different for COVID. Um, how do you determine that an occupation is at a significantly greater risk than the public at large? And sort of the two-part question of that is, how do you take into the uh, consideration the fact that we're now moving to a place where we have mandatory vaccinations in long-term care and assisted living, and even if it's going to be in acute care and home health as well, what impact will that make? Yeah, so good questions. Um, in answer to the first part, um, how do we determine... We basically, I mean, we will ask people what their particular job duties are. Even if somebody says to us, I work in a long-term care facility, we are not automatically assuming that person is providing direct patient care. We still ask, like, what is your job title? What do you do? Because that person may actually work for a long-term care facility, but they're an admin person and they're actually working from home. So that changes things greatly for us, right? So we're actually looking at what that particular person is required to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for us, just generally as a practice, somebody who is coming into contact with various members of the public or multiple patients or, or families of patients that they are providing direct care to. And when I talk about direct care, I'm talking about within two meters for more than 15 minutes or having to actually touch the person, deal with bodily fluids, et cetera, or be in an enclosed that space, like closer than the two meters. We're probably gonna consider that person to be at higher risk than the general public. That was probably much, and that was quite easy to say pre-vaccination because we basically were all walking around unvaccinated and you don't know kind of who has what or who's protect, protected against what. It doesn't really change much with the vaccinations because what we know about the vaccination is that it does not, and it was never intended to stop somebody from getting COVID. People can still be vaccinated and get COVID. They just don't get as sick. And certainly, just like some people that are not vaccinated, you can have COVID and be asymptomatic and not know that you have COVID. So we would certainly not discount people providing us information that everybody in the workplace was vaccinated. That may cause us to ask those more those deeper questions to that person about, okay, have you been around anybody that wasn't unvaccinated? Were you contacted by public health outside of your work setting? Um, was anybody else in the house sick prior to you, those types of things. Um, but it doesn't 
come into play in terms of just that general question of are you at higher risk than the general public? Because one could also make the argument that in workplaces, most people are vaccinated, but in the community, most of us are vaccinated as well, right? I think 80 some percent of British Columbians have their first shot and 70 some, I think, have their second shot. So workplaces are a bit of a microcosm of the community as a whole. So we need to look at what exactly is going on in the workplace. I think that's a really helpful answer. Um, I'm going to be a bit devious and uh, play devil's advocate a little bit yeah. and talk about that really specific period of time where vaccinations were rolling out in long-term care and assisted living and it hadn't been rolled out to the general public. Um, what kind of, how did that affect the decision-making at Work Safe BC at that time? Decision-making in terms of bringing presumption in or decision-making like on a claim-by-claim -claim basis? Accepting on a claim-by-claim -claim basis. Yeah. So again, it didn't really change too much because if you think of it, even if everybody in the workplace is vaccinated, if there are, if there is workplace transmission, obviously somebody brought it in. We're not denying that in order for COVID to come into the workplace, somebody had to have brought it into the workplace, right? So somebody may have gotten it outside, brought it in. Again, people are being vaccinated when they're rolling out the vaccines, those people would have just had one. And we know that one vaccine is not as good as two. So if we were to change our thinking, we would have had to change that. Well, who had one vaccine, who had two vaccines, etc. And again, because we know in the med medical literature shows that the intention of the vaccine is not to for nobody to get COVID or it doesn't, that's not what it does because people can be vaccinated and get COVID. So with that being the case, if people can get COVID while vaccinated, then vac a vaccinated workplace can transmit COVID if somebody has brought it in. So I guess that plays into another question that I have. And you did touch on this a little bit in the presentation, but I would love for you just to expand on it a little bit because you, mm -hmm. you went through it a little bit fast. Um, is what are the sort of the factors that you would look at or maybe fa evidence that you would look at, WorkSafe BC would look at to determine that someone had been exposed um, outside the workplace and actually mm -hmm. that their claim was um, not, not due to their work? Mm -hmm. um, so just like any other claim, if somebody tells us that they've seen their doctor, we'll request chart notes. And sometimes in those chart notes, it'll say, you know, person was contacted by public health as a direct contact of their brother or, you know, so that that is something we will ask people, were they contacted by public health for contract tra contact tracing purposes outside of their work? People are legally bound to tell us accurate information when we ask them. So when people give us answers, we are taking that as fact, unless we have um, something else, you know, unless we have reason to not, and then we'll investigate that further. Um, and, and, you know, we'll take, if we need to, we can try to get lab results and things like that for dates. If it seems like the person's unsure of the date they tested positive or unsure of the date that a family member tested positive, we can't ask for the family member's information, but we can ask for their information from the lab. Um, so, you know, our, our folks have done this quite a bit now. We've had 6,600 claims for COVID-19. Um, and so we have, you know, a host of questions that we do um, ask and the answers to those questions will lead us to ask more questions. Um, but with presumption, our job, with presumption likewise, a worker's job is not to prove to us that they got it at work. Our job is to find out if there's anything to rebut the presumption. So I know that there's that kind of can sometimes be a, a conception that, oh, it's in presumption. That's that means that everything just gets allowed. No, it makes it a bit easier on the worker to not have to prove it. But we still have to look at if there was anything, if they got it from anywhere else. And we've definitely come across a lot of things were on the face of it, we would have said, yeah, I think that person, you know, meets presumption, but we asked that question, was anybody else sick in the household? Oh, yes, my daughter was. Okay, how did that happen? You know, what happened? Well, she got sick about three days before me, and we did get a notice from the school saying she was exposed. Okay, so that, that you know, something like that would rebut it. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful piece for um, our providers on the call to, to understand. Um, again, I, I do encourage people to, to put their questions uh, in the Q&A function, so I'm not the only one um, putting Lauren on the hot seat here. 
Um, but I just have one last question. And, sure. and if uh, nobody else in the room has a question, we can always wrap this up early and, and allow folks to get back to their day. Um, so one of the things, and frankly, one of the reasons that I wanted to um, co-host this webinar with, with Safe Care and others um, was we had been hearing a couple of anecdotes um, that, you know, were making people ask questions. And it was about, you know, a and it's not clear how widespread it was, but it was a couple of different care homes that, you know, said, well, we didn't have any other confirmed cases among our, our staff or our workers, but then we had, you know, one case that came in and, um, you know, the, the claim was accepted and they were kind of questioning that logic. I was wondering if you could kind of go into that piece a little bit. Um, well, without knowing what the specific circumstances are of a particular claim, and even if I did, I wouldn't obviously be able to talk about it in a public forum, but generally, yes, we've had some of those same inquiries from an employer, right? Like, this is the only person at work that got sick. Um, I, so how could you possibly be saying that it happened at work when we don't know? Um, in the care facility setting, obviously, you have residents that would probably, if they develop symptoms, would probably be tested. In a general public setting, it's a little bit different because we can't go back retrospectively and say, okay, well, who was in the store and did they have COVID, et cetera. Um, but, you know, for in the care facility uh, setting, we're taking a look at, again, did, the, did that, because the, the presumption law tells us we have to look at, did the person's job duties put them at higher risk? So are they pro providing direct patient care? Uh, working with co-workers closely, um, you know, the, not don't have the ability to work from home like the majority of people who worked in an office would have had. And if the answer to all of that is yes, especially in a healthcare setting, and there's nothing to rebut it. So, and that's really what we need to, would need to hang our hat on if we were going to say no in that situation is, is there anything to rebut it? If in that instance or in that particular case, there was nothing to rebut it, there is nothing that we would be able to, to say then to disallow that claim because the rebuttal of the presumption is not met. So I definitely understand where the questions arise and where the frustrations arise if somebody's saying, but this is the only person. But again, we need to think about asymptomatic transmission. We also need to think about some people don't disclose um, about COVID because there is a huge stigma attached to it. So, you know, somebody might be ill, take time off not say anything. There, there are a whole host of things that could go on that we could assume why we only believe it's one person, um, but we can't make decisions based on those assumptions. So we're having, we need something concrete to, to rebut that presumption. Great, thank you for explaining that further. I, I remember in our pre-conversation, it was kind of that um, conversation about asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission um, that, that really sort of answered that question for me and uh -huh. understanding how it works. Um, I did have a question that came in through the, the Q&A function. Um, someone, and this is a bit of a, I think this is a good one, um, is wondering just, you know, how does this apply to something like seasonal influ influenza? Um, mm -hmm. And how is this um, presumption different, um, you know, under uh, public health emergency orders? Sure. Um, so with influ so in, in occupational disease services, we do adjudicate uh, claims for the flu. We don't get a ton of them, but during flu season, we do get, you know, a decent amount. Um, typically flu claims um, are not allowed because it, or yeah, the claims are not allowed um, because it's usually around flu season. So most people, it, it's, it's something that's common in the general public. And it, we would never look at it under presumption because in my career at WorkSafe, we have not had um, a state of emergency due to influenza. We have not had public health orders being issued due to influenza. So we just look at it under the same regular contagious disease policy, which is 28.00. And the criteria there would have to be met. Um, but typically, uh, of the flu claims, flu claims are not accepted. Um, we do get some, but it would be looked at completely differently. Um, the flu, in order to be treated the exact same way, would have to um, be under a state of emergency or have some health orders. So it would kind of have to be like the flu in 1918, right? If something like that happened that was influenza, then uh, there would probably be some type of state of emergency and we look at it under this, but we don't currently. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really important piece maybe to underline a little bit. I did hear you say it during the presentation, but perhaps it went by a little bit fast for somebody, uh, for some folks. And maybe you can expand on this again, that the reason that we currently have the presumption is because we have, um, it's the state of emergency. And at one point we also had the public health emergency if I'm getting that not mixed up. But um, once we get to a point in, knock on wood, once we get to you know, a point in this pandemic where it's not a pandemic anymore and COVID-19 is endemic, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and those emergency clauses are lifted, then the presumptive clause, for example, would no longer apply. Is that sort of correct? Yeah, that's right. So there was a time where we had the public health emergency, and I think we had, we were under the public health emergency for over a year. Uh, I think it was about 15 months, something like that. During that same period of time, there were orders under the Public Health Act. The, the state of emergency has been lifted, but there are still orders under the Public Health Act. And there was four criteria in column one there of presumption that I, and those were two of them. So we currently are in, we currently are using presumption because we have orders under the Public Health Act. You're right that once those go away, if nothing else changes, then none of that criteria will be met. So we won't be looking at COVID-19 under uh, presumption. It would just be looked at under policy 28. Um, and I think it would probably start to be adjudicated more like the flu. Um, because if you, you know, this is a little bit, just a little bit of history, but prior to presumption coming into place, because presumption came in August 20th of 2020, we were dealing with COVID claims for months before that, because we got our first one, I think, in March of 2020. Um, so we were adjudicating for a number of months just on policy 28. We were still allowing those COVID claims, though, because we were having to turn our mind to what is the current environment? Well, in the middle of March, basically anybody who could work from home was sent home, businesses shuttered, everything was shut down. And so anybody leaving their house for work was probably at higher risk because they had to interact with people. They didn't have the luxury of being able to work from home. That reality is going to be different when presumption is taken away. And we're again looking at just policy 28, but businesses are not shuttered. Um, you know, everybody has resumed regular life. There might not be mask mandates anymore. The numbers are quite low. So then we're looking at a scenario where COVID-19 is called something different than the flu. It's not influenza. And I'm not here saying that COVID is like the flu because it's not. But if from an adjudicative perspective, uh, it may be looked at the same. Yeah, always careful about that distinction. <laughs> yeah, um, no. And it would be wonderful if, if and when we get to a place where um, this this is uh, looked at in a similar way, um, adjudicated in a similar way to the flu. So, knock on wood about that. Um, I'm I'm not seeing any further questions coming in on the chat. Um, so maybe we'll give folks a, a couple of minutes back in their day and I will just thank everyone for attending the information session and to Lauren for taking the time to present on the topic and answer all of these questions. Um, Lauren, if our members have further questions about the presumptive clause, um, who should they get in contact with? They can get in contact with me. Um, so when, I'll, when I send you, Laura, the PDF version of the slides, I'll give you my full contact information. So if you want to disseminate that to everyone that's getting the slide deck, you can um, feel free to email me or call me directly. My information uh, will be on there. That will be really helpful. Um, so on that note, um, thanks everyone for attending the webinar today and have a wonderful rest of your, your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. All right.